Comic-Con Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today we are joined by a fantastic guest, and now is the time for all of you in our chat room to begin typing in your questions for him. Immediately after this session, you will have the opportunity to talk to him directly through our private chat options, as well as shop our selection of personalized autographs, all of which are available now at GalaxyCon.com. So without further ado, let's meet the man that helped us help to warn us that the visitors were not our friends and made every kid in 1982 want ferrets, falcons, and dyed tigers as house pets. He is an actor whose body of work includes the Beastmaster films, V and Arrow, and much more. Hopefully we'll talk about a lot of that. Please welcome Mr. Mark Singer. Hi, everybody. It's good to be with you. Oh, you, Patty. I am well, sir. How are you doing? Good. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, I hope all's all is all... All is well in your corner of the world. It, it is so far. We've uh, we've um, we've managed to to keep our sanity such as it is throughout this long pandemic. I hope it's the same for everybody who's tuned in. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure it is. Like I said, I uh, the I the we're on we're on the we can we can see we can see the horizon now, and um, yeah. I, I I get that. Yeah, I think I think we're all going to get there. I think we're going to have a. Uh, Society is going to have a little bit of a scar from all this that'll last a lot longer. But uh, I, I think, I think we all, I think we all can think we're almost there. If not, we can certainly see the end. I think one of the best uh, things we can say about it is it keeps people like me off the streets. Oh well. <laughs> Well, one thing about this, though, when we get you off the streets, and certainly at GalaxCon, we are looking forward to the day when, yes, we can get you off the streets and get you on our stages and get you back in front of your fans. In the meantime, we have this forum we call the GalaxCon Virtual Stage, and it's an absolute thrill to have you here. I appreciate it. I think one of the ways that uh, actors feel most comfortable and also most uh, contributory towards society is when they're on screen or on the stage in front of the audience and people come together and and share a similar experience and get a chance to uh, reflect on what it is that uh, that we're all doing here together. That's a good thing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So our team right now is going through the chat room, pulling out questions for us. Uh, in the meantime, when I have a solo guest, I always like to just throw this out. What what drew you to uh, become an actor? You know, it was, uh, uh, I guess every actor who would say that it was sort of fated in the stars. Uh, but for me, uh, it really came, uh, uh, by way of my father tricking me into going to see a movie about knights. And it was really uh, Laurence Olivier starring in uh, Shakespeare's Richard III. And I kind of got into it in those days. But it wasn't until I was a junior in high school that by happenstance, I got picked to play the lead in, uh, in a Shakespearean play. And that was, that was the beginning of it. Then I understood that this is what I should be doing with my life. I was never a very good student. I never was very, uh, uh, very studious or, or given to that kind of stuff. But I was raised on the Gulf of Mexico in Texas. And so most of my time was spent, you know, at the beach or in the, in the water. Uh, but I do, I do think that um, uh, people who find themselves with a kind of an outsider's view of society should think about the creative arts. They should think about painting, writing, sculpting, filmmaking. Those are things they can do. Oh, that'll be for me. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> can you get that phone? Thanks, baby. That's my my daughter who's uh, indulging me today. <laughs> uh, five away. And uh, that speaks well of the arts. And uh, if I understand correctly, uh, your family was heavily involved in, in, in the arts I think, uh, and musically, correct? It's true. They, uh, I come from a family of musicians. My father was a symphonic conductor, my mother a pianist, my brother a cellist, my sister Lori Singer, who's not only an actress, but she's also a virtuosic uh, cellist. And then uncle and aunt, both pianists. And uh, uh, so I was surrounded by, uh, by uh, performers. So performing didn't seem that unusual for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was simply finding the right venue. But that doesn't mean that you have to come from a performing family to be comfortable, Certainly. be drawn toward the arts. I think it's for everybody. Uh, my my dad sold cables, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Indeed, so we too. So, out of curiosity, you got some guitars there behind you. Uh, do you plunk those occasionally? Oh yeah, you know I I uh, I torture the neighbors, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, and also I've got uh, uh, I, I I try to turn this isolation of. Uh, of the pandemic into something uh, uh, creative and valuable. And um, I know that for me, uh, the piano, which sits a few yards away, uh, has also suddenly opened up to me and I've begun to compose on the piano as well. So nice. uh, 
I mean, it, I know that we're all uh, in a way uh, constricted these days. And uh, uh, but on the other hand, just like what we're doing right now, there are ways of, of turning it, uh, turning it into something more useful and in, in fact, fun and, and creative. So that's 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 my that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Right on, right on. So, uh, so you hit the ground running as an actor. One of your uh, earliest, I say, genre works, and by that I mean sort of in the geek spectrum, was on the Planet of the Apes television series. Oh yeah. Oh, I really enjoyed that. You know, when I first came to Hollywood, I was so wet behind the ears as far as, as, far as what filmmaking was. Uh, let me put it this way: I was very successful on the stage, and I knew, I thought, pretty well what acting was all about. But it wasn't until I got on film that the that the inner work of the actor uh, began to develop, and that had to come from all sorts of things, including the idea that there actually was a Hollywood. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. I was driving up the freeway from San Diego, where I was working at the National Shakespeare Festival, mm -hmm. and the sign over the freeway said Hollywood next three exits. And I turned to my wife and I said, "There's an actual Hollywood." I, I didn't actually know there was a Hollywood. I thought it was an idea. I thought it was an idea. Wow! It was, it was like it was like hearing of Marilyn Monroe. There's an actual Marilyn Monroe. I didn't. I it, had no idea. It, yeah. it 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 achieved the the yeah. ephemeral status of a never never land where just things happen. I suppose no no there really is Hollywood right there. See the sign. Oh, okay, you're gonna play that way. You're gonna bring in ephemeral on me. Okay, all right. Okay, well, that's okay. I can do that. Um, <laughs> uh, the um, I applaud you for it. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, Planet of the Apes. Um, uh, they had the I, I had the pleasure of working with a wonderful actor, a, a man named Bill Smith, and he was about six foot four, six foot five. Yes. And and he was a real rounder. I mean, he this was a guy who got in fights all the time, sort of as a recreational activity. Uh, and um, uh, they tried to show me how to. In uh, how to throw a punch, which I'd never done before, oh, wow. especially not on film, and I had I had the unfortunate uh, I had the misfortune of actually hitting him, and uh, and people took me aside and said, "Do you know who you just hit?" And I went, "I know, but I I hope I don't find out either." And, and as it turns out, he was a very sweet guy and took it all in stride. And, 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 and to all. And to our audience to, to know, uh, Bill Smith was a, a, a wonderful actor. Going by, as far as back as a child, he appeared in some classic, uh, you, one of the classic Universal horror films, uh, Fra Ghost of Frankenstein. But he's probably, you may know him as Conan's dad. Crom is your god. That's and, right. That's and, right. And uh, he was a great character, great character actor, wonderful guy. I had an opportunity to meet him and speak a little Russian with him because at one point he worked for the National Security Agency in his military career, and that was all he'll ever talk about that. So, yeah. So, yes, if you you really decked him in his prime and you're still here to talk about it. Well, I, I, don't, know, <laughs> I, think my, I, I don't know if I decked him. My wrist is still sore. Okay, all right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, 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 thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Uh, you, you were, you, you, you were in the system at that point, and uh, you did, you did a film where you worked with one of my favorite directors and one of my favorite actors. Go tell the Spartans with under director Ted Post, and you got to share some really good scenes with Burt Lancaster. Uh, Burt Lancaster was uh, such an amazing uh, man to work with, and such a such a generous. Uh, uh, mentor. I remember the first scene uh, on "Go Tell the Spartans" that we that we that we filmed. Um, here I was, a new actor, fresh in town, uh, young man standing on stage, in with one of all of filmdom's greatest uh, icons, and uh, here I was playing sort of second fiddle to him. Uh, and it was the first scene, and. Uh, Ted Post, this wonderful, wonderful director, yeah. uh, was uh, back behind the camera, and uh, there's Bert sitting at his desk like this, you see, and me standing beside him here, and uh, the Ted Post says, action. And Bert stops, and he looks up at me, and all this is rolling, it's all on camera. He looks up at me, and he says, you know, kid, he says, when I was a younger man, all I had to do was say, hey, baby, ha, 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 ha. And Ted Post is behind the camera going, what? Baby, where's that in the script? He says, all I had to do was say, hey, baby. He said, well, who could resist me? Said, but as I've gotten older, and he took a puff off his cigar, it's forced me to learn how to act. He said, 
And, and you, you can't help but fall in love with a man who had the world at his feet most of his career, yeah. who could still speak about himself with such self-deprecating humor. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I remember uh, at the end of filming, uh, and he, he tried to teach me to walk on my hands, which I could never do. And the producer came and said, what are you doing? Because he got up on his hands at 70 years of age or whatever he was smoking. He, say, he could still do that at that time. Wow. Well, he put a cigarette down, stood up on his hands and walked around a little bit. And the producer came over to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? He said, what if he has a heart attack and, and falls over? And I said, that's Burt Lancaster. He's not going to have a heart attack. You know, I, I, there were, there were, we have competing interests on the set, I think, at that time. Mm. But at the end of the show, I'm sorry, I, I, I could go on forever about, about the Spartans and about, the, about how fortunate I was. I worked with, with in those days, Burt Lancaster, Henry Fonda, Geraldine Page, Olivia de Havilland, um, uh, uh, Maureen uh, O'Sullivan. These, these, these were all people that I, that I actually had the honor of working with, and I could learn from them right there firsthand. Yeah. At the end of the filming of Go Tell the Spartans, I was heading back toward the dressing room late at night, uh, probably early in the morning, and Burt Lancaster was coming down the trail this way. And I said, you know, Bert, I said, they're wrapping me out of the show now. I'll be finished. And I said, I just wanted to tell you what an honor it was to, to work with you and, and how much I admire you and what, what lessons I've taken from you. And he looked at me and he said, well, kid, he said, I just got here like everybody else. And he turned around and walked away into the dark. And that was the last I saw. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What an experience. Yeah, lovely man. Lovely. Yeah, man. and 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 a, and a very and a very fine film as well too. It's, uh, oh, it's one of those films I call undervalued. I remember uh, a representative at the time uh, saying, "Why do you want to do this film? They're, they're they're hardly paying you any money at all," which was his take. And I said, "I'm working with Burt Lancaster." He said, "Yeah." I said, "Have you read the script?" And he picked up the script, and it was like a it was like a comedy. He riffled the pages like this. He said, yeah. <laughs> well, never mind. I'm, I'm doing the film, so let's sign me up. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Uh, another one of your, uh, I would say, undervalued projects that I'm still very fond of, uh, if you can see what I hear. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's the story of Tommy Sullivan. Mm -hmm. uh, Tommy Sullivan is a... Uh, uh, a performer uh, with an absolute golden Irish tenor voice uh, and uh, blind since shortly after birth uh, and um, made a whole career for himself uh, and became a, a star in the, in the pop music scene uh, as a, as a composer and as a performer. Mm -hmm. And this was the story of his life, his wild yeah. life when he was a youth and it yeah. was a wonderful comedy. And we, I made it with Sherry Belafonte, Harry Belafonte's daughter. Yeah, um, and uh, and you we made got, you got you got to make out with her in that movie. That was <laughs> yes, 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 yes. She 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 earned her payday. She earned her job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, and 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 you and absolutely kudos to you. You really sold it in the scene when your character, who is blind, is trying to find a girl who is drowning in the pool. I oh. thought that was really they feeling it out and yeah it was that's a, that's an actual that's an actual true incident uh, a young a young girl falls into the pool and tom in this case played by me mm -hmm. being blind then has to find her body floating somewhere in the vast limitless reaches of a swimming pool and he did it by listening for the bubbles that yeah. were coming from her mouth yeah. And that scene, I have to tell you that I, I'm not a, I'm not a great fan of watching my own. So a lot of, a lot of us that work on film don't yeah. watch our own films over and over again. Mm -hmm. We're not all Gloria Swanson. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, but we, uh, uh, but when I see that, that, that scene of him searching for her and then finding her and reviving her in time, I have to say it, it gives you a clutch every time. It's an amazing, it is. an amazing man. He was, he was fun to travel with when we were, uh, promoting the film. I saw, I saw him once. The, you know, you, you think about the stories about people are just legendary and uh, and maybe mythical. 
But I saw him once uh, addressing a, a bunch of people in a restaurant we were visiting and, and he was speaking. And a, a waiter walked back, walked behind him, didn't touch him, didn't say anything to him, just passed behind him like this. And Tom, in the middle of a sentence, said, I'll have a cup of coffee. <laughs> he, he knew so much and could sense so much that it was, it was, it bordered on the miraculous. It really Yeah, did. absolutely. Absolutely. And then I think the same year was when Beastmaster hit was 82. I, I think so. I think around. Yeah. Then anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and then, then that, of course, either it was 82 or I'm 82. I can't remember which it is. All right. Something. Well, well, we'll let the chat room figure that out. But uh, yeah, that, First of all, 1982, uh, held by my generation as the greatest year ever. So many wonderful uh, geek-centric uh, uh, products came out. And be, like I said before, Beastmaster made us all run around and uh, imagine we have Kodo and Poto. And, and, and just, so how did Beastmaster begin for you? Well, it was a, it, it's a, first of all, to comment on the idea of, of that era of filmmaking. Um, that was the time, basically when the idea of sword and sorcery began to assert itself as an important venue in filmmaking, uh, there were all sorts of uh, uh, sort of post psychedelic magazines and uh, books and articles uh, that began to explore uh, post post apocalyptic themes in a more serious way and began to uh, to develop a real artistic sense about uh, alternate universes. This was long before, or maybe around the time of the first discussions about black holes and things like that, and multiple universes being in parallel uh, uh, tandem with one another. Uh, and so uh, I really, uh, I, 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 had been, I had been scouted, I guess you'd say, on stage okay. when I was playing Petruchio in Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew hmm. in, in San Francisco at the American Conservatory Theater. I, it was a wonderful production. I was fortunate to receive the uh, LA Drama Critics Circle Award for the leading performance of Petruchio in that play. Yeah. And, the, and the director uh, of The Beastmaster, its auteur, I guess you'd say, Don Coscarelli, yeah. had seen that performance. And, uh, and he sort of made up his mind right then and there that I was the guy that was going to play the Beastmaster. So, you know, Hollywood is, it really is the land of dreams. Um, it, it, when I was a child, um, everything was cowboys when I was a child. Yeah. Everything was cowboys. Yeah. Lone Ranger, Hopalong Cassidy, uh, Roy Rogers, Kit Carson, you name it. Uh, everything was cowboys. Um, and, uh, so one day I'm walking along the streets of Los Angeles and I'm Mark Singer, an actor who's being absorbed into the community. Thank you. Uh, and the next day I'm the Beastmaster and forever after, forever thereafter, I'll be the Beastmaster. And that's a, it was a, a great and singular uh, uh, realization of a childhood dream because who didn't see the Lone Ranger that wanted to be the Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. And so one day I grew up to be my version of the Lone Ranger. Yeah. It was a Beastmaster. So it was kind of, it was, it was wonderful in that way. I met, I met Clayton Moore who played the original Lone Ranger. And I was, as ex I was, I was playing, I was already the lead in the television series V. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ran up to Clayton Moore like any fan would do. And I said, Mr. Moore, I said, I can't believe you. I watched you every weekend on The Lone Ranger. I wish my brother was here so that, so that he could meet you too. And he looked at me as though, as he would any fan. And he said, take it easy, son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's wonderful. And, and again, I, Beast, Beastmaster is just, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful matinee popcorn film. It's, it's, I just watched it again recently. It still absolutely holds up. And it has a very, I think, underrated cast uh beside yourself john amos tanya roberts you know it's like rest rip soul and rip rip who had just and he had just done something real heavy i think beforehand and just something that was very erudite and critical and then he jumps into at this a popcorn movie and uh yeah he, he was so much fun to work with and everybody was quivering in their boots at the at the thought of him coming because 
uh, he he for somehow for some reason he had uh, had accrued at that moment uh, the the reputation of being difficult and spiky and demanding and this and this and this and uh, I was standing uh, I remember dressed in my leather hula skirt and uh, and yeah. uh, I was standing out there freezing and uh, talking to the director about a shot and I became in a sport jacket standing next to me and uh, we were talking and I said well what and you might hear that and I looked and and. It was Rick Torn. And without an instant, I've never met him before. I, as I say, I was relatively fresh in town. I looked at him and I jumped on him and kissed him because I was so thrilled with being in the presence. And he laughed and we got and and uh, I think he gave me I think he gave me basically the Clayton Moore answer, which said, oh, take it easy, take it easy. And uh, <coughs> but from, then, from then on, whenever I saw him, from then on, whenever I saw him, he would say, He'd see me, we'd be at some function or thing. He'd say, hey, singer, hey, singer, that's the only film they'll ever remember me from. <laughs> uh, well, Cincinnati Kid. I'll always remember him for Cincinnati Kid. <laughs> Which I think is the is superior to the hustler, but that's a to debate for another day. But and, um, and, and men in black. And Men in Black, yes, Men that. Black. What it is, Rip would do something sort of geek centric, like once a decade. That would brand that people would. Imp this culture would check out of that. So for the '80s kids, he was the the villain in the Beastmaster throwing the kids in the flaming pits, which <laughs> I thought was pretty brazen for a PG movie <laughs> at the time. Yeah, you know, well, that's the thing about being on on set of these films. You have to. Uh, you have to remember and it, it, that that things affect the audience a lot more deeply in the retelling of it very often than we feel on the set yeah. because for us we're seeing all the mechanics that go into it and there's a really a kind of a dark humor to it all you know although we give it when we when we sympathize with it and when we empathize with it in the portrayal of it of course we give our heart and soul to it but in the mechanics of it when you step back and see how films are made Actors, directors, writers, producers develop a kind of a wry, um, kind of gallows humor about about some of the stuff we 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 do. And, and yeah, Don certainly is very famous for that. He's a very sly filmmaker uh, for his body of work, everything else from the Phantasm series, Bubba Hotep, and that's just yeah, that he, that's the way it is. He is in that way. I, I think one of the most admirable. Uh, 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 members of the community in the fact that he is virtually a self-made man. And the, and, and back to what we were talking about originally, which is that, and I, I don't mean to in any way um, uh, belittle Don's talents. I'm just saying this is an open forum yes. for anybody who feels creative and wants to pour their energies into, into their life's work. Filmmaking uh, provides so many avenues for that. And today, uh, you know, kids today, kids the kids today, they have so with, with YouTube and the TikToks and everything, everything else. They they have a, a much wider field of opportunity to just. That's that's one thing I always tell everybody: just make it yourself. Just just yeah. just go out and and make it yourself. And if you're good, somebody will tap you on the shoulder and say, "We want you to make this for us." I I agree. I think and I I think that's a wonderful thing. And and. Uh, and God knows they take advantage of it and should. That's a wonderful thing, you bet. Indeed. Is the negative from Beastmaster still missing? Oh, uh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is, it, is this on? <laughs> oh, all right. All right. Uh, those are audience that do not know the the original negative for Beastmaster is uh, still missing. Uh, they are still looking for it, and hopefully, if it's ever found again, we can have a really nice, crisp 4D transfer, and uh, hopefully, bring you and Mark and do commentaries and the whole nine yards. But that's that's kind of uh, yes. Well, the uh, the the uh, the original uh, uh, print is not only missing, but my sword is missing. Uh, I left it. I left it for one final shot. It was promised to me uh, since I did so much of my own stunt work. Uh, it was promised to me at the end of the show. I left it with them for one last shot because I was at the end of that show. But I was exhausted. I was on my hands yeah. and knees. Yeah. Uh, and in that instant, somebody swiped it. So it's out there somewhere too. So mm. if anyone knows where that is, I'd appreciate that being sent back. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that way too. So, and uh, and then of course uh, we have to talk about your time when again you and uh, your castmates uh, try to hold off the threat of the visitors. Oh yeah, John V. And again, uh, and, and and putting people in context, people don't understand that it was a, the first miniseries was a big event. I mean, America was was kind of glued to it, and uh, the sequel afterwards, and. And again, another wonderful cast you got to work with. Robert Englund's nicest role. Faye Grant was historically beautiful. Jane Balder, villainously seductive. And Michael Ironside was my first man crush. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, before we before we uh, delve too far into the particulars, I want to pay a special tribute to, uh, to the auteur, Kenny Johnson, yes. who was the pr original producer, writer, director of, uh, of V and whose, uh, whose vision made it a wonderful analogy to the encroachment of uh, fascism into our lives and Nazism uh, by drawing parallels between uh, 1930s and 40s Germany and the uh, takeover by the visitors. And uh, I think that's what gave it its uh, kind of intellectual, gave intellectual heft, I would say, yeah. uh, to, the, to the original uh, uh, offering, uh, yeah. um, miniseries. And I'm glad that Kenneth was able to tell his original vision in, in, in prose form. I was, I was very glad he had that opportunity. Cause I know yeah. it, 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 it was, yeah. In V the final battle, uh, I know that things soon come ahead he departed and it was not the direction he wanted to come into as much as I enjoyed it as a kid. And I was glad, I was, I was glad he was able to get his story out there the way he envisioned it. I, I, I am too. I'm glad that the, that the initial was, was uh, given some air and I'm glad that the second one was as well, because there is an important, uh, a important role of just plain uh, fun and educate. Uh, yeah, just plain fun and entertainment, you know. And yeah. uh, personally, uh, it was like uh, like being a member of the a circus troupe. The second the second bunch was because yeah. anything you thought of to do, the company would say, "Okay, let's do it." And uh, and so all sorts of stunts and all sorts of fun uh, every day. Yeah. What's uh, what was what was the most what was the fondest memory you take from V? Oh boy, there's so many. I mean, I, I it's it sounds uh, kind of sappy to say it, but uh, really the fondest memory I had from V is the um, is the general interaction with with the studio system, mm -hmm. with uh, with being on the Warner Brother lot, for example. Uh, at the same time that uh, uh, Steven Spielberg was uh, filming Hook, and at the same time that John Wayne uh, was uh, was on the uh, on the lot uh, filming scenes from The Shootist, um, uh, and um, uh, the sense of Hollywood history, uh, uh, I think of all the studios, uh, my my favorites uh, are the uh, Warner Brothers Studio and the. Um, uh, 20th Century Fox Studios. Um, I'm, I mean, I mean, in a sense of just being on the lot and sure. and, and living within the within the within the history that they contain. Yeah. Um, uh, all my cast members are, as all cast members that I ever have worked with, uh, are, are basically people that I've fallen in love with. It's a, it's the first. It's probably pretty common to a lot of us uh, in the industry as performers that we. We share such a an, an electric moment between us, and and uh, and such intimacy, and such re reliance on one another to make everything work. Uh, that uh, falling in love is is one of the first emotions that strikes us. Very well spoken. Very well spoken. So, well, I, all I can say is that. I, is that I just, I just have to thank you. I have to thank you for all these performances you, you've given throughout your career. And um, as, as I always tell it, I, I, I thank you for your talents. I thank you for your professionalism. And I thank you for the performances because V especially is very dear to my heart and um, all the permutations it went through and the changes and everything else. And I, I, I stayed through it through the end and um, yeah. I appreciate your sentiments. And I, uh, I, reflect, uh, I reflect those sentiments back, not only to you, for your professionalism, but but inclusively to everybody who sees us now at this moment, witnesses us, because we're all part of this. We're all part of that same dream. We're all part of that same realization, that same magic. And so uh, uh, right back at you, my, my, my darling friend, right back at you.
<laughs> and speaking of the people watching us, I think we are good to go on our audience questions. So let's go ahead and roll our first one. And this is going to come from Ginger, and they want to know, what was the most memorable moment working with the animals in the Beastmaster? <laughs> and I, 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 I know <laughs> there, there are stories. I know that. Uh, they're, they're, uh, one of them, I, I mean, they're, uh, they're, they're, le they're legion. But um, <laughs> um, other than the five, I'll start out with the, with the, with the kind of the softest best. And that is that um, uh, Kipling, who was the black tiger in the, in the first Beastmaster, was like a Buddha. Kipling understood everything. And he was the first person I said hello to every morning and the last person I said goodnight to every night. And every time I was on screen with Kipling, I sent him the vibe, which I actually believe that he understood, which was that this moment that we shared was about him. It was not about me. And at that, at that moment for me, the whole film was about animals and so forth. One of the memorable moments, however, was when one of the tigers that we were auditioning took my entire leg in its mouth as we were walking along a desert trail with the other handlers in, uh, in around. And suddenly everybody got very quiet and we mm. all looked at the clouds. We all looked very peacefully at the clouds and thought peaceful thoughts while the tiger decided what to do with my leg. And then after a moment, it let go of my leg and we all walked on and the handler said, I think we'll find another tiger. Mm. Uh, that was one. And another one was where a, a handler was standing right next to me. And as this another tiger that we were auditioning came by and its head is as big as a washing machine. And it came by and the, and the handler said, so uh, what we're all, he said, and the tiger stood up nine feet tall and bit right through his arm. Uh, at which point all the other handlers rushed in and hustled the tiger away. And, uh, and the last I saw of this guy, his arm was okay after a while, by the way. Yeah. The tiger did like a hole punch. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and he was okay after, after that. But the last I saw of him was in the back of a pickup truck bouncing across the desert on the way to the emergency room. Oh boy. And I think there was a bear attack as well. Oh, the bear. They, <laughs> the animal handlers said, do we have time for all this? Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. We're, 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 a, we're a quality over quantity show. Oh, oh, great. Oh, I thought I was going to rush these stories along. <laughs> the, the animal, the, the bear story was when I first went out to, uh, uh the, uh, menagerie that kept all these wild animals for, for Hollywood filmmaking purposes. The animal handler said, Hey, let's show him sugar bear. Let's show him what sugar bear can do. Yeah. Here, Mark, go stand behind that cage over there and we'll, we'll get sugar bear out and show you the trick that sugar bear can do because sugar bear is going to be in the movie. I said, okay. And I went behind some cage and they said, no, 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 Fur further back. And so I went further. They said, no, 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 further back. And I went further back yet. And they went over to this big cage, this big enclosure out in the desert. And inside was this massive grizzly bear. Oh, little piggy eyes and in a bad mood already. And they said, and they looked at one another and said, you ready? And they said, okay. And they unlocked the, the cage and they opened the cage and the bear came out. And they both were like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And so they, they showed me this trick. And the trick, you want to know what the trick was? Please. The trick was they could get Sugar Bear out of the cage <laughs> and they could get Sugar Bear back into the cage. And that was the trick that they knew how to do with Sugar Bear. And Sugar Bear was the first shot up in the movie. And after he got through knocking around one of those handlers, I saw them carrying him off in a, like a fireman's carry between two men, you know, like oh, this. Wow. Little, and they said, uh, Mr. Singer, you're up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which was, and, and thinking about it now, I think. Are you was sure a, it wasn't Bill Smith in a bear costume? Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, even Bill would have had his hands full. Yeah. But, yeah. I think that was the last time they called me Mr. Singer on the set. Mm. I think from then on was Hey You. I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Ginger, thank you. That was a wonderful question to start us off with. <laughs> And what do we have next? This one comes from Liza. When you were filming V, did you realize that it would become a cult classic? 
No, you know, uh, first of all, nobody ever knows that. You, you just, you make something, you do the best work you can, you put your heart and soul into it, all your sincerity, and, and you just you just hope for the best, you know. Um, um, uh, I don't think any of us making that initial miniseries had any idea that it would be such a hit. And in fact, uh, Ken Johnson, uh, in putting this thing together, uh, 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 had a screening and the screening was at the then Directors Guild Theater, uh, which was a different location than it is now. A massive theater, uh, lavishly appointed with a huge screen in, in, the, uh, uh, in the front. And the audience was packed, absolutely jam packed. And those of us who've been working on the film, we already had had, I think some of us, a, a significant careers in, uh, in film or an, at least enough to be somewhat blase about it and say, I think we understand what it is we're making. But when those curtains parted at the at the uh, at the beginning of the of the show, and this incredible spacecraft came over that took up the entire screen, and we began to understand what it was that Ken Johnson had been putting together, mm -hmm. we were awestruck. I mean, founded. And in those days, such things as a as a spacecraft that that went from horizon to horizon, yeah, that was a, that was a that was an original. That was a first. And uh, and so, uh, but I will say that we did leave that theater thinking <laughs> we're sitting pretty. We are we're sitting pretty. But when it blew the top off the ratings, I think we were all surprised. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, well, when, whenever this question comes on up, I usually follow up a transposition of yeah. When when did you begin to realize that uh, the project was perhaps even exceeding uh, expectations? And obviously, the, when the, when the numbers came back on the initial miniseries, I think that was like. I think I, I I probably suspect that it did uh, kind of uh, outstrip even the the most optimistic viewpoints. It, it did, it did, it, it, and uh, and and uh, you know, acting is an uncertain profession anyway. Maybe maybe a lot of things are like uh, golf and poker, but but acting is an uncertain profession, and so the idea that you're involved with something that might have uh, a, a continuing uh, future, meaning a paycheck. Uh, is 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 very reassuring to an actor who otherwise is is would be out looking for their next job. And um, one of the things you have to learn in, in the industry as that as time goes by is to bear with uh, both good fortune and adverse times, and uh, never never to be overwhelmed by one or the other. Absolutely, absolutely. Liza, thank you. Wonderful question. And a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to chat with Mr. Singer like I am now or purchase a personalized <laughs> autograph, sign up at galaxycon.com. And let's go ahead and roll another one. Absolutely. And this comes from Radio Man 970. What kind of pets do you have in your life? I have only one pet in my life. Minkerton, where are you? <whistles> come here. People are asking about you. I have only one pet right now. And each time, every time, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come, 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 up, 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 up. Come here, come here, come up, come up, come up, up, come up, come up, come up. Ah, boy. This is, this is Minkerton. Minkerton, let's say hello. Who's that? And we do a new act together. We do Crazy Old Coot and Dog. You want to see a, 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 a little bit of Crazy Old Coot and Dog? I would love to see a scene selection from Crazy Old Coot and Dog. Okay, you ready? Oh, 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 who is that? Where is that? Right. Come on, give it to me, baby. He's a little camera fly. <laughs> it, gets, it gets a lot. It gets a lot wilder than that. Yeah, uh, you should uh, do a YouTube series. I'll subscribe. Thank you, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right, Radio Man nine seventy. You got an answer and a little bit of a show. Thank you for that. What do we have next? Uh, it comes from Chris. How do you still manage to say in amazing shape? Uh, by never appearing in public. Um, I, uh, I think that's the best way and that way you can skulk around behind trees and so forth and nobody can actually tell what you look like. No, I, I'm a, I'm a student, a continuing student of Kung Fu. Uh, I have enormous, uh, uh respect and, uh, and deep affection, uh, from the Chinese community, uh, uh, and more particularly, uh, for those up in Seattle at the Seattle Kung Fu Club. Um, uh, the, the work ethic in Kung Fu, as well as uh, thousands of years of cultural uh, focus on all the aspects of civilization that China has experienced in an unbroken line uh, come to us in different art forms. And uh, uh, that's one that has stood me in good stead. In fact, I, I would uh, 
I would uh, really defend the notion that uh, without Kung Fu, uh, I could not have sustained uh, nor even achieved in the first place uh, the career that I that I've been so fortunate wow. to enjoy. Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Chris, thank you. That was a good one. Hey, what's next? From Adrienne, do you have a favorite book? Uh, I have a couple of favorite books. Uh, I have a, I mean, I have a library of favorite books. I have a library of favorite authors, but, uh, uh, the, the two books that, uh, uh, currently, uh, are holding my attention is one, uh, I, I read books and then I reread them. And I reread them and I reread them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one of them is John Steinbeck's, uh, in dubious battle. Uh, mm -hmm. that book that I think every is, is, is overlooked. And, uh, and I think has enormous relevance for our day today, uh, but it's just extraordinary uh, storytelling and a historical perspective as well. I, I'm an enormous Steinbeck fan. Uh, and then another one is a, um, uh, a, a more recent uh, author, and I, I'm not certain that she may not have passed away by now. I, I, her name is Dolores Phillips, and uh, the name of the book is The Darkest Child, and it's a harrowing read. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's brilliantly told, and I, I believe that it's an important, uh, 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 I, I believe it's important reading uh, for everybody uh, in the United States, certainly. It's wow. called The Darkest Child, yeah. All right. There's us. us. Adrienne, thank you. That was a wonderful one. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with Mr. Mark Singer, but it absolutely does not have to be yours. If you'd like to chat with our guests like I have today or purchase a personalized autograph, sign up at GalaxyCon.com. And while you're there, please check out our schedule of upcoming events just like this one. Mark, this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, any, any parting words for our audience before we go backstage? Uh, just a, a one repeated many times. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. That's about what it. it. What is your favorite Shakespeare play? Uh, my favorite Shakespeare play is uh, Troilus and Cressida. Uh, I, in fact, in many ways, far outstrips Hamlet. Uh, I'm not to, listen, who am I to denigrate anything that Shakespeare wrote? But uh, for Hamlet, basically, if you have good legs, good legs and a kind of a, a poetic spirit, you can play Hamlet. But uh, you have to be a giant to uh, to be a member of the cast of Troilus and Cressida, intellectually, emotionally, and uh, and physically. It's just a, it's a great great play. But Shakespeare is the foundation of our modern psychology and our modern literature, and even the language that we speak right here. We use his we use his phrases even here. Absolutely. Mark, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you again for joining us, uh, the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank, thank you to our audience for joining us today. And absolutely thank you for all those great questions. Hope to see you all again soon. Until then, folks, please take care. Bye-bye. And please keep washing those hands. <laughs> yeah.